Hello, my name is Tessa Asquith Lamb and I'm an artist. I work at the City Arts Centre and other venues delivering workshops and also leading describe tours for the visually impaired. In the first video today we're going to be looking at some 1920s still life paintings by Scottish artists. The first painting we're going to look at today is called Still Life with Melon and Grapes and it was painted in the 1920s around the 1920s by Samuel John Peplow. Now Peplow is one of the Scottish colourists along with John Duncan Ferguson, Francis Cadle and George Leslie Hunter and he was born in Edinburgh in 1871 and he studied in Paris and that's really evident in his paintings how he's absorbing all these new ideas that were filtering through the schools in Paris. And we'll see in this painting when we really analyse it just how modern his way of painting is but also how it reflects art of the past. Now he actually lived in Paris from 1910 to 1912 and again while he was there he's meeting people like Picasso and Matisse and his work does become more and more modern but he never becomes kind of truly cubist in his paintings. By that I mean he's never showing more than one side of an object at once but his paintings do become slightly more angular so this painting here shows a, a large golden melon at the back balanced on a white plate and in front of it and on another plate green and black grapes and then cascading around that is a kind of white crumpled cloth which moves diagonally across the picture frame towards the foreground of the picture and on it are what look like maybe a peach and two oranges. So you've got a mixture of fruits in this painting, all kind of luscious colours, the golden colour of the melon, the greens and the kind of luscious dark colour of those grapes, and then the really intense orange and peachy colours of the other fruits. Maybe there's an apple in there lurking behind those grapes as well. Behind what looks like the corner of a table going in like this, there's a chair in the background which looks like it's got um, kind of some cloth on it and some white walls behind but where it matters in the painting behind that kind of melon with its little stalk sticking out it's quite dark behind the picture and that's doing two things the chair and the wall behind are suggesting kind of the room beyond the painting and then they're also providing a really good dark background for that light golden colour of the melon the two lines of the corners of the table that come in diagonally like this also lead your eye in. Imagine if it was just straight across like this, then your eye might kind of drift off at the sides, but by having the edges of the table come in diagonally like this, your eye is being led back to the melon at the centre and those kind of fruits in the centre of the picture. And that cascade of kind of um, white, um, what looks like crumpled fabric, that's also doing a similar thing, it's leading your eye kind of into the picture from that corner. The paint is quite thickly applied and there's really kind of definite dark edges around these shapes and they're almost kind of an inky blacky brown in places and they're really kind of defining the shapes. It's a very modern painting for its time. But of course, still life painting goes back many, many hundreds of years. And there's echoes of the great Dutch masters in this picture who he'd also studied. And in Dutch still life paintings, you often get a very, very dark background, which really lets the colors kind of sing out. So there's echoes of that there as here as well. The next painting we're going to look at is called Still Life with Pears and Grapes, painted again around the 1920s by Samuel John Peplow. This painting has quite a kind of landscape format and it shows a dish with pears and grapes, so two pears and some green grapes, in a kind of quite a shallow white um, dish. And then in front of that, two pears have kind of escaped from the bowl and they're um, into the foreground of the painting, one right sort of almost central to the picture and one on the far right. And behind the pears and the fruit, we've got the bottom of a wine bottle, looks a bit like a champagne bottle, kind of greenish glass, and a really elegant flute of a wine glass. The background is quite loosely painted and the whole picture has very visible brush strokes. Again, he's used that compositional device of having two diagonal lines coming into the picture like this, leading your eye in, so that all these objects are really concentrated on that background. 
everything's got quite thick brush strokes thick what we call impasto paint where it's really kind of thick and you've got visible brush strokes and you really get a sense of the solidity of these objects weighed down on the table you're really convinced that these pairs are actually laying there if i get a pair and put it i hold it in my hand i can feel the kind of weight of it like this but then if i put it onto a piece of cloth that's kind of slightly loose and crumpled like this you can see that i immediately get these shadows around it that kind of give you a sense of its weight kind of pressing down on the ground and that's a really interesting compositional device because it gives you a sense of the weight and the solidity of the object and also obviously it's giving you a white background so the colors really kind of sing out and show up as well so he's using this in a lot of his paintings this idea of white cloth in the foreground which gives you kind of something for the colors to really kind of show up against the next painting we're going to look at is called a glass of milk painted by stanley kirster in 1923. stanley kirster's previous work had been heavily influenced by italian futurism in this art style Images are fragmented and faceted and have lots of very dynamic angles and movement in them. But this painting is from slightly later on in his career. And in the 1920s, his paintings became more naturalistic. This painting, A Glass of Milk, is really about how you paint different tones of white and the relationship between objects in a still life painting. First of all, it has a dark background and this immediately helps by throwing all the white shapes forward and gives them a really good clear silhouette, especially of the handle of the jug and the shape of the jug against the background. There's a soft line, almost like a horizon line, where the table ends and the background begins. And everything forward of that is in much more sort of focus. The large jug on the left hand side is presumably full of milk and has a blue speckled design and it feels kind of a bluish white. It's angled away from us so that we can see this interesting sort of design of the jug which has got quite complex angles, quite difficult shape to paint. The handle itself is angled towards us as if we could reach out and touch it. The dark shape within the handle also helps with the three dimensional effect that's given by this part of the painting. In front of the jug is a crumpled piece of white cloth. This really draws your eye into the picture and hides where the jug kind of joins the bottom of the, um, the table. It kind of forms a way into this painting, almost like a sort of river or stream flowing towards us. It's got these lovely dark shadows in the crumpled cloth. Below the jug are two biscuits, the warm, dry, biscuity tones. They look a bit like rich tea biscuits. And of course, when you've got milk, you always kind of think about eating some biscuits with the milk. And then to the right of the biscuits is the glass of milk itself. It's worth thinking about how you actually paint a glass of milk. The milk itself is visible through the glass and it's the shape is defined by that glass. If I hold this glass of milk up here, the milk's very sort of creamy white. And there's a darkish line here where the glass begins in the base and you can see that in the painting and you can also see these highlights of light on the glass here and the, the sense of that kind of ellipse at the top he's painted that in and these lines here and there's a darker shadow where the top of the milk is revealed and you can see all these in the painting there's also a dark shadow that comes from the glass towards the jug and that kind of links the two things together. If they were figures in a composition, this is almost like these two figures are relating to each other, the jug and the milk are kind of relating to each other in the picture. Below the milk in the cup, in the glass, are a little selection of teaspoons. And they again are pointing sort of into the picture. They act like little arrows leading your eye into the picture. So we've got the cloth, bottom left, and the teaspoons bottom right and both those things lead your eye into the picture it's almost like a kind of heart shape leading you in and then you go up round the handle of the jug and round the milk and then you come back down to the biscuits like this it's a really interesting sort of compositional device but there is that sense of space in this picture there's a kind of refreshing space right in the middle of the picture in between the jug and the milk it's a really skillful and very beautifully handled painting Stanley Kirster, also in this decade, as well as being a painter, he had a kind of parallel career. 
um, in gallery administration and he became a keeper of the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and then later on director of the National Galleries of Scotland in 1930. The next painting we're going to look at is called From My Bedroom Window and was painted by Adam Bruce Thompson around 1920 to 1925. It's different from the other still lifes we've looked at today in that it shows not only a still life subject but also a landscape. Adam Bruce Thompson was born in 1885 and attended the first the Trustees Academy and then Edinburgh College of Art where he received diplomas in painting and drawing and also architecture. He also won scholarships that meant he could study abroad and he went to Spain and Paris. He was a really accomplished printmaker working in etchings and lithographs and lots of different medium. This beautiful painting is from the 1920s so it fits within this window of our other images but as I was saying what's different about it is that it opens up into a wider world. Just to analyse what we're looking at, the still life element of this picture is a large basin with a towel across it and this diagonal snaking line of the towel is the way into this picture, it really leads your eye from that bottom right hand corner into the picture. The basin is also accompanied by a little dish with a lid, this is probably a soap dish. From the 19th century, well into the 20th century, lots of people would have been very familiar with um, large basins or bowls like this, which had accompanied by a big jug or ewer of water, and these were to have a wash in the morning. You had them in your bedroom, and you'd have your soap in the little lidded dish at the side, and that cloth is probably a towel across it. You can't help thinking it would have been quite cold to have a wash every morning though there, especially on what looks like a really cold day out through this window. It has that really bright light that you get on cold days though and it's so dazzling that as it comes into the room it's almost bleached out the top of the washstand or small table that the basin is on. It looks really really bright but where the basin hides the bright white from us we can see the kind of dark rich mahogany colour of the table. The bright light also is making some really intense dark shadows under that cloth that leads you into the picture. The landscape behind is of wintry blue trees, almost slightly moving in the breeze. They reach kind of spindly arms up towards the sky. There's a sense also of buildings around them and in the distance, and especially on the right hand side where we can see the gable end of a cottage or a sort of slightly larger building with chimney pots, and then you've got like little lean-tos or sheds in bottom right. And then on the left hand side, you've got the sense of maybe some grasses and a bit of a kind of stepped wall. The window is framed by this brilliant little device of a scalloped pelmet and these two kind of golden buttery coloured curtains that come in at the side. And they just lead your eye in and frame this, this scene. And we could just imagine getting up in the morning and opening those curtains and looking out onto this scene and looking out to see what kind of a day it was and the trees gently moving in the breeze. It's really sort of icy and blue in its handling of paint, I think. You can almost imagine it having quite a sort of chalky feel, a softness to it, especially as there's a the kind of clump of slightly smaller wispy trees within the shapes of these much thicker, larger trees in the centre of the image, as if there's some sort of slightly small, spindly, almost like willow trees in the middle of this clump at the bottom of the garden that we can see out of this window. It's an exercise in how you deal with space in a painting and tone. You've got the sense of the distance that you have by looking through a window, but then you've got the sense of homeliness and the intimacy of the, of the bowl on the table and that kind of feeling of being somewhere kind of quite domestic, but yet looking out into the distance. So I hope you've enjoyed looking at these pictures today, which all share the subject of still life. And we've seen some really interesting compositional devices that are used in these pictures from the 1920s. In our next video, we're going to be uh, attempting a still life painting, which hopefully can utilize some of these compositional devices. So I really hope that you'll join me for that video. We've seen just looking at these, just how arresting and interesting still lives can be. 
And just the moving around of these objects and deciding really carefully where to place them can be something really kind of contemplative and interesting. And moving them very carefully until you're really happy with the composition is something really wonderful. And you feel like you're almost moving about and kind of organizing little characters until they're in the right kind of exactly the right feeling for you for your painting. So we'll explore that a little bit more in my next video, which I hope you'll join me for.